Hello and welcome back to my Rings of Power Season 2 discussion slash breakdown series. We are back once again. If you are new to these videos, I encourage you to share your thoughts and comment down below, but ask that we keep our comment section respectful, appropriate, and don't indulge in hate speech. I do not condone that here on my channel. If you're interested in hearing more of my minor musings about the show, feel free to check me out on Twitter. A link will be in the bio. But without any further ado, let's just get right into it. There's a lot to talk about, so here I am yet again, Rings of Power Season 2, Episode 5, Halls of Stone. All right, so the episode starts off real strong with a sweeping Peter Jackson-esque shot over the mountain range where we enter Casa Doom via sort of morph transition into the seven rings that have been now been completed off screen and delivered to the dwarves. Uh, we see Durin the third reach for the large big blue crystal one takes it. We then cut to the mines where Durin the fourth and Narvi are working hard to find the sun shafts. We see King Durin shows up and is kind of acting all strange. We see him put a hand on the wall and he has the new ring, which has allowed him to sort of see gaps in the mountain. And he is able to find the sun shafts, returning light to Casa Doom and restoring the way of life to the mountain. We see that all the dwarves are super stoked to have the light back, except for Disa and the Stone Singers, who are noticeably upset about this, but more on that later. I think this is a great introduction to the episode. I think it showcases the power of the rings, how they're going to benefit the dwarves, and really sets up a lot of the conflict moving forward into the episode, as we will come to see. The celebration in Casa Doom is juxtaposed with the celebration in Eregion, where we see Celebrimbor has invited over a group of dwarves to commemorate their friendship and unveil the doors of Durin, which we have seen in live action before in the Peter Jackson adaptation. Um, in the books, we know that these, do these doors were forged and inscribed with Celebrimbor and Narvi the dwarf working together. So it was cool to see them stick to that canonically. I will say, while this scene was a cool moment to finally see the doors, I was a little disappointed by the lack of setup that Celebrimbor and Narvi had. I expected that going into this season just because with the focus on Anatar and Celebrimbor, I figured they wouldn't have a lot of time to really flesh out this relationship with Celebrimbor and Narvi. Um, yet another thing I really wish they would have taken the time to set up during season one, since Celebrimbor and Narvi are such an important and impactful canonical relation in the lore that really highlight the, the, f the few strong friendships between elves and dwarves throughout their history. And the show seems to have kind of taken that plotline and given it to Elrond and Durin, which works well enough to get the point across, but I will always lament that we never got to see that connection between Celebrimbor and Narvi. We see that Anatar is completely dissociated. Um, he stalks away from the party, kind of sapping some of the joy out of Celebrimbor, who's feeling really high off his accomplishment. And we, one of the things I really like about this episode is we get to see Sauron in full toxic manipulative mode. He, there are so many great scenes in this episode where he just fully manipulates, lies, and just kind of puts everyone at each other. He's pressed for time. I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that he spurred the orcs on. They're on their way to a region. They're gonna get there. They're gonna mess stuff up. Sauron needs to get these rings forged before the battle commences, or at least be mostly done with them. I do really like how Celebrimbor even points out um, how Sauron is attempting to plant the seeds for making the rings for men as one of Celebrimbor's ideas. He says it flat out. This is a thing you do, is it not? Sowing seeds and convincing others the fruit is of their own thought, or something along those lines. I really like that Celebrimbor is not completely unwise to what um, Anatar slash Sauron is doing to him, he's just unaware of to how grave a situation it really is. We see Anatar lay it on thick, he brings up a lot of really cool references to Erendil, Tuor, Baron, son of Barahir, and he's really trying to convince Celebrimbor that if we just make these rings for men and we give them to, you know, the good, honorable men, then it will, it will help them since they're the ones who are most um, being affected by Mordor's rise. I really like the line he says about, you know, I fear Numenor more than any other kingdom in Middle-earth. I think that's a really fun nod to the fact that Sauron does fear Numenor. Um, it plays a major part in the story of the Second Age, and that it's going to be really fun to see Numenor and Sauron clash over season three and four, when I think that conflict 
will come to a head. Um, but Celebrimbor's not having it. He thinks that men are greedy, don't deserve the rings, and flat out refuses to forge them, to which Sauron says, all right, I will go ahead and make them myself. Speaking of the tie-in to Numenor, we go back to Numenor where we see the newly appointed King Ar-Farazon and his sniveling son Kemen are talking about the idea of mortality. Um, Farazon mentions, no matter how high we climb, there are some things that are forever withheld from our grasp. This, it's about time we got this. I've been waiting all season one and most of season two for the Numenor plotline to really boil down to the essence of why, they, why there is conflict and this idea of mortality. I think that season one did a really poor job of setting this up, and while there are hints, I think the language they used was too modernized. Um, they had that scene where the guy in the town square was kind of going off about elves taking our trades, and they made the issue seem to be more of like anti-immigration sort of things where they didn't want any of the elves inside Numenor and they wanted to keep their trades and keep work in Numenor and the fact that they're finally exploring the idea of no it's more about mortality and being denied the potential to really do something that matters within the short lifetime they are given. I was really glad to see that, and I think that scene was so well done. Farazan is seen manipulating his weaselly son Kemen by saying that his mother foresaw an ill fate for him, which he kind of holds over his head as, I'll tell you about it if you complete my task I have for you. I do want to say, uh, two videos ago, I said that I liked Kevin. <laughs> I kind of enjoyed him as a character. I This episode, holy cow, he they finally gave him something to do, and jeez, yeah. We then cut to Muriel and Elendil, who are talking about the uh, usurp of power, and how there are still some people who vie for Muriel. We find out that Elendil saw a different vision when he touched the Palantir, which was not the vision that Muriel and Galadriel saw, the destruction of Numenor with the Great Wave. Muriel takes this to be a sign that because Farazan is king, the future has shifted and they need to not interfere with it in order to save Numenor. I think this is interesting. I think there could be a little bit of misinterpretation here because I think that Muriel saw her ultimate fate and I think Elendil saw his ultimate fate, which was successfully escaping the takeover in the city of Armenolos and escaping to the west. Another fun point, um, I'm calling it now, in the shot where you see him riding away on the horse, it is hard to see it, but there is a sword hanging from his saddle and the scabbard is white, which is part of why it's hard to notice. I'm just gonna throw these images up of concept art and the fact that we've already seen this sword last season teased um, as being in the tower. I guarantee you, Elendil is going to get Narsil at the end of the season. I'm calling it now. I think this shot is going to be his final shot of the season. And before he leaves the capital, Muriel is going to give him the sword. Speaking of giving away swords, um, the next scene we see after they have their conversation is the Sea Guard are asked to turn in their uniforms as they have been stripped of titles due to their loyalty to Muriel instead of Farazan. Elendil shows up and gives away his sword, which he was gifted last season. We see that Aarian and Kemen are the ones leading this. Um, Aarian has been appointed to some position. It's still kind of unclear, but she's apparently a big deal. Uh, in the Kingsman now, as she has the authority to demand all the Sea Guard turn in their uniforms. We get an interesting scene where Aarian tells Valendil that she can vouch for him and get him reinstated, to which he declines because Aarian is being a jerk. Elendil heeds Muriel's warning and remains the calm in the eye of the storm and walks away without generating any uh, tension or escalating the conflict, and we see all of the Sea Guard call out to him saying Valar bless you and Captain Leaving Deck and all this stuff like that which I thought was really fun to just see the type of leader that Elendil is. Um, I'm really excited to see where his character is going to go. I'm looking forward to getting a lot more for him as the series goes on. The last scene we get here is Farazan approaching the Palantir. Um, he doesn't touch it. I do think he will at the end of the season. We've kind of seen some shots in the trailer that suggest he is going to look in the Palantir. I'm really interested to see 
what he's going to see. Um, if you have any ideas on what you think it could be, uh, leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear your speculations. I think there's so many cool things it could be. That scene transitions to Gilgalad receiving the letter from Celebrimbor where he lies about everything being all fine and dandy and how he's shut down the forge. This pans over a shot where we see one of the doors of Durin being used as a table. Um, some people have kind of gone after this for being like, oh, what? They're really using the door as a workbench? I would just like to point out that it looks like they've got that sort of Ithildan dispenser device on it, and only some of it has silver, so I don't think that this is them just using it as free space. I do think they're still working on the doors, which is part of why I don't think we saw it glow during that scene, which would have been a really cool reveal. I think they're saving that for the end of the season. Gilgala gets a really strange vision. I don't know what to make of a lot of it. I'm pretty sure most of it is supposed to allude to the Siege of Eregion that is impending, um, but it's a really cryptic. I, I kind of enjoyed this one as compared to the other ones that were a little more cut and dry. We see them debating whether to press towards Mordor or Region, and we don't really get the answer for it. Uh, we get a little bit more of this later in the episode. Um, I'll get to that later, but we still don't really know where they uh, where they landed on that, so it's kind of left mysterious for now. We then go back to Casa Doom, where Durin and Disa are tending to the tree Elrond gave them. Um, we see that Disa is really struggling with the idea that the king has been using this ring to access a power that she and the other stone singers have cultivated over a lifetime of study practice, and she calls it even a blessing from Aule, who, if you don't know, is basically the patron god of the dwarves. This I really enjoy because I think, and again, so many people always attack this show for not having anything to do with Tolkien, and then you get moments like this and conflicts like this which are so Tolkienian in nature. Every single episode this season has had a major Tolkien influence moment. And when I do my final recap of the season, I'm going to try to like take all those points and like bring them to light because I really think this show does do a good job of exploring themes that Tolkien heavily included in his works. And this one is the idea of technology and machinery. You kind of see as this ring is basically serving as industry. It's bulldozing over tradition, it's taking away the sacred art of stone singing, and I think it's a really interesting concept they're exploring of this idea of cheating or advancements made solely for the purpose of advancements. I'm really interested to see how it plays out. I think it's a really compelling arc for Disa and adds a lot more complexity to her character. We then see them out in the marketplace where Disa buys a tuning stone for her daughter's birthday. Uh, we learn about a 100% tax called a ring tribute, which the geode merchant uh, tells them about. This is the first sign that the greed of the ring is starting to get to King Durin. Um, before we can really elaborate on that though, Disa drops the geode and it rolls down the street, which must have rolled a really, really long way because she finds this mysterious cave that she's never seen before and calls into it to locate the resonating stone, which she successfully does. But something calls back, which intuition tells me is the Balrog, although I have seen some people speculate that it could be the Watcher in the Water, since this area kind of does give off those vibes. We then get King Durin talking to the Dwarven Emissaries from the Seven Kingdoms, which I'm really glad to see because I was kind of worried for a second the show was going to give all seven rings to Khazad Doom, but they are still holding true to the idea that there are other Dwarven Kingdoms, most of which are in Rune. I would love to see those kingdoms, but I really don't know that it's going to happen. With a show like this, you know, it's really hard to introduce new locations all the time, new kingdoms, especially on a whim. We then get King Durin talking to Narvi, and he basically tells him verbatim to delve greedily and too deep, which is a pretty famous phrase used to talk about the inevitable fall of Khazad Doom, where because the dwarves delved too greedily and too deep, they awoke a nameless horror in the depths, um, being the Balrog. I think this is definitely foreshadowing that. They use the same language. I'm really nervous about the Balrog here. I'm optimistic that they won't have it destroy Khazad Doom this season, but the fact that they keep featuring it so heavily in the show, like, it's basically Chekhov's Balrog, where it needs to be used at some point. It needs to make an appearance, and I don't know how they're going to do that in a tactful way. I'm sure there is a way they could do it. Maybe a group of dwarven miners go too deep underground and the Balrog takes them out and they're like, oh shoot, don't go down there again. 
but I don't know. I mean, the Balrog is not supposed to destroy Khazad Doom until well into the Third Age, so it would be. I mean, they've already compressed a lot of the timeline for the show, but that would be a little too far, I think. Though I don't know that they'll be able to pass up on it, since it is such an iconic piece of Middle-earth history, and I could see them being overzealous and wanting to cover it, even though it doesn't really fit into the scope of the story. We get Prince Durin who comes in and warns King Durin and Narvi not to go underneath the mines because Disa heard something an evil, ancient, and powerful. King Durin tells Narvi to disregard that and dig anyway, so clearly something's coming to that. We then go back to Eregion, where the smiths are trying to forge rings without Celebrimbor. Uh, we get Myrdania enters the Unseen World. This scene was a little interesting to me at first. I was kind of confused on what was going on. Um, I thought that maybe like Sauron was making things float around or something, but she was just invisible, which I don't really want to get into the lore. I think there's a lot of other Tolkien creators out there who have kind of delved into the specifics on whether or not an elf should turn invisible when wearing a ring of power. I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but I get what they're trying to do. They seem to be exploring this concept of rings being tied to the unseen world. And through this, we get the exposition that Myrdania sees Sauron's true form. She describes it as a tall being with skin made of flames, eyes dark and pitiless, reeking of death. I think it's a pretty cool description. I wonder if we are going to get to see inside the Unseen World at some point as a viewer and see Sauron's true form. I don't know that we will. I feel like the show is kind of keeping the Unseen World as a sort of mysterious other realm, and I kind of like that they're keeping it like that, at least for now. We see that Anatar is taking advantage of the disarray and hectic nature of the forge to try to get Celebrimbor to help them forge the rings. I've seen a lot of people compare this to like, when your dad's helping you do homework so you purposely act like you don't know what you're doing, so he'll take over and be like, ah, oh, okay, whoa, whoa. It's kind of what he's doing here, where he's purposely forging the rings poorly so that Celebrimbor will come in and do it for him. And I've heard a few people talk about this, and I have a few theories about why exactly Sauron is doing this. We get later, this is jumping ahead a bit, but we do get a scene where Anatar talks to Myrdania about the fiery being she saw in the Unseen World and convinces her that it is Celebrimbor's spirit. Um, I don't think this is entirely untrue to the route the show is going. Obviously, the spirit is Sauron. It's not Celebrimbor. But I think that concept of forging the rings taking a toll, I think is true. I think we, well, we know in lore that when Sauron forges the One Ring, he pours his essence into it, tying his fate to the ring. I think something not too dissimilar is happening with the Seven and the Nine. I think that Celebrimbor is corrupting his soul by forging these rings, and I think that's why Sauron is using him, because he's trying to basically use up Celebrimbor's soul to make the rings for him. But anyway, that's, I think that tracks for why Anatar Sauron is using Celebrimbor to forge the rings for him. However, before Celebrimbor can give them any advice on how to make the rings better, Durin the Younger shows up, to which Celebrimbor goes out and speaks with him. Durin tells him about the rings not working. He warns him about Anatar. He says, how much do you really know about this guy? And you're starting to get these seeds of doubt forming between the relationship of Celebrimbor and Anatar. Again, I love everything with their relationship in the show. I think they're handling it so well. Charlie Vickers and Charles Edwards, they are knocking it out of the park. Their performance is so good. I touched on this a little bit earlier. Sauron talks to Myrdania about the being she saw. He convinces her that it is Celebrimbor she saw, and he is trying to help save his spirit. He swears her to secrecy, and he makes a strange comment about how when her hair caught the light, she looked like the appearance of Galadriel. I've seen a couple people speculate this might mean that she's secretly Calebrian or Calebrian. I don't, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. I think it's Calebrian, who is Galadriel's daughter. Some people have speculated she should be showing up soon because she is alive during this point in the lore. Uh, we do know that she was in Eregion. There are some lore moments that happen with her immediately following the siege of Eregion. So it would make sense for her to kind of come into the show at this time. But there are some things that don't make sense, like why she's using a fake name, why her and Galadriel haven't talked or anything. Um, Galadriel went to Valinor in season one. Like she was leaving, leaving, and she didn't say, oh, let me say goodbye to my daughter really quick. So it does make you question the validity of that theory, but 
there could be things we just didn't see on camera. Either way, I do think it's an interesting thing to speculate on. We then go to Numenor, where we see the faithful are holding a sort of funeral ceremony for those who died in battle. They've got these little seashells with candles they're kind of sending out as sort of memorials. You've got Elendil, Valendil, and then Kemen shows up and crashes the party, says that the temple is in the way of the new aqueduct they're building, and basically just ruins everything, breaks a statue. Uh, Elendil gets pissed and punches him before Kemen can react and punch back. Valendil catches his punch, they get into a fight, Valendil near gets the upper hand and nearly kills Kemen, to which Elendil convinces him not to, but when his back is turned, Kemen kills Valendil, which really, really sucked. That, that was a gut punch. I was not expecting them to take Valendil out of the show so early. For those of you who don't know, Valendil is the name of one of Isildur's sons in the book, so when this character showed up, a lot of people figured, oh, okay, so they're really good friends, so Isildur will name one of his sons after him. I thought there was going to be more time to explore their relationship and their connection, and it makes it all the more bittersweet now because he's ultimately going to name his son after his best friend who died. So yeah, that was a brutal moment. That's the reason why I'm no longer a Kemen fan. <laughs> he's, he's definitely the worst, so I'm... Um, Looking forward to his ill fate, which uh, my personal theory, it's not even my personal theory, a lot of people think this, um, I'm calling it, he's going to be a Nazgul when the rings start getting handed out. I'm guessing he's going to be a prime candidate for one. Elendil takes the blame for it and gets thrown in jail. And that's the last we see of Numenor in this episode. We then get a conversation between Celebrimbor and Anatar, where Celebrimbor tells him what Durin says, that the rings are not working. We get a really funny line where Anatar says, as one who manipulates metal, be mindful that you are not being manipulated yourself, which is so funny because he is being manipulated by Anatar. He asks him point blank, like, did you alter the rings? And we get this really sick response where Anatar says no. And then there's this long pause and he says, we did. And basically throws the blame on Kilabrimbor and says, the three rings were forged in purity and in special sacred purpose, but the seven were forged into seed because you sent that letter to the High King. That is why they don't work. And just totally puts all the blame on Celebrimbor. It makes him spiral. It makes him worried that he's made a huge mistake. Anatar is so toxic. I am obsessed with his betrayal. Speaking of the rings not working, we cut to the Durins, Durin the third and Durin the fourth. He runs in and confronts his father and says, do not trust these rings, there is some malice upon them, to which King Doran completely deflects and says, oh, I'm so proud of you, and I need you by my side, and gives him his, like, mantle bib thing, I, I can't remember what it's called, and reinstates him as heir to the throne and Prince Doran. And we get a scene where he comes back home, looking all ashamed, Disa's pretty furious with him, but makes him promise, whatever you do, do not wear one of those rings, like never wear one of those rings. While I understand why the show is ramping up the corruption to obviously further the narrative, speed along the plot, it is kind of crazy how much they're going into it because it really makes you wonder why would they keep these around when they're so clearly problematic and detrimental to dwarven life. So I'm wondering what the remedy will be for that. We then get the penultimate scene where Celebrimbor has succumbed to this idea that the seven rings were a failure and he announces that the only way to redeem the project is by making the nine rings together. He gives a very harsh speech where he talks about they must give every hammer stroke perfect, they'll work day and night, if anyone gives anything less than their best, they will no longer be a smith of a region. And when he kind of rushes off flustered, Anatar steps in and he is now the good cop and he's all, Oh my friends, I know that your master seems unreasonable and crazy and stupid and evil, but don't worry, it's gonna be all right. And I really enjoy how he's managed to kind of shift the loyalty of the Smiths. He's really doing a great job of isolating Celebrimbor. Again, there's so many layers to his performance as Anatar, his relationship with Celebrimbor, I cannot get enough of it. I also think that Celebrimbor is in this horrible situation where I think he's sort of understanding that Anatar is not who he says he is. Something is wrong. But there's really nothing he can do at this point. He is totally in his power. He is trapped. There's nowhere for him to go. He's feeling helpless and alone and afraid. And my heart goes out to Celebrimbor. Charles Edwards, 
You were killing it in this role. Final scene we get in the episode is the orcs arriving at Oregion. We see them bringing in a cage, which is revealed to have Galadriel in it, which we saw her captured by orcs at the end of the last episode. Um, Glug approaches her, it's kind of unclear. I thought that he might've been searching for any last hidden weapons she might have, which we see in a second she did have one. Um, other people have talked about he might've been trying to cut her hair. Uh, whatever the case, Adar grabs his hand and stops him, to which Galadriel gets the upper hand, is able to put a knife to Adar's throat. He gives the line, I did not bring you here as a prisoner, but as a potential ally. Obviously, Galadriel is not going to help Adar destroy Eregion, but I think that they're going to try and work together to defeat Sauron. I think that something is going to happen to put them at odds again, where maybe Galadriel will be like, I'll help you destroy Sauron as long as you promise not to attack Eregion, and Adar is obviously going to go back on his word, or something along those lines will happen. Overall, I think this is definitely my favorite episode from the season, and maybe even the series in general. I think one of the things that I really liked about it is there was a clear focus on the storyline. So much of the show so far has been not knowing where things are headed. You've got all these storylines building and it's sometimes hard to follow. Every episode there's a new location introduced, there's a new character introduced, there's an entirely new plotline introduced, and this was the first time that we got an episode, at least that I can remember, and my light died again. Anyway, the first time we got an episode that I can remember where we got something that was entirely focused on things that had been established prior, and it really was the heart of the season, this connection between Celebrimbor and Anatar and the Seven Dwarven Rings. I could not get enough of this episode. It has me so excited for what's to come. And again, Celebrimbor and Sauron need more screen time. I was very upset that they weren't in last episode, and they really haven't been in a lot of the episodes leading up to this. So this episode was a much needed dose of the Celebrimbor Anatar relationship. And I really hope the next three episodes are jam packed with more of them. Things are heating up in the show. I think the Siege of Eregion is slated to start within the next episode, whether that'll be towards the end or the middle is unclear, but things are gonna get pretty intense from here on out. All in all, I would give this episode a 9.5 out of 10. I really loved it. I had very few things to complain about. Anything I did have to complain about feels very minor and unimportant, but yeah, I would love to hear what you all thought about this episode, whether you enjoyed it, whether you thought it could have been better. Feel free to leave your comments down below. Again, please keep them civil, keep, keep them respectful. If you want to see stuff on Twitter, I will leave my link in the bio. I try to post fairly regularly there. But thank you. If you enjoyed this video, you want to continue with the discussion and be here every week for my continued series where I try to make a review for every episode of the season. Please consider subscribing. It helps the channel out. And I would love to hear what you thought of it. But that's that. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.